This is Julian Barber from Washington, D.C., reporting on President Nixon's Cambodian decision, which has been a subject of controversy in this country and abroad. Because of that decision, much of the attention of the world has been focused since April 30th on Cambodia. Today, we'll examine why the President of the United States felt compelled to send forces into Cambodia and what has been the military outcome. At the end of April and on the first day of May, American and South Vietnamese forces began crossing the frontiers of Cambodia. They drove initially toward two regions they believed concealed major military encampments. Accompanied by American advisors, a South Vietnamese force of about 15,000 struck at a base they contend has been the major source of attacks on their capital. And meanwhile, a combined team of 7,000 American and South Vietnamese troops advanced into another region which they considered to be a troop staging and supply center. Hanoi denounced the moves as brazen U.S. aggression against Cambodia. But the Cambodian delegate to the United Nations, Kim Teet, publicly appealed to Americans to understand and support President Nixon's decision. Without it, he said, his country would be crushed. American officials said their forces entered Cambodia on a limited mission to deny the enemy supplies from a chain-like fortress network, which extends along the South Vietnamese border with heavy concentrations just 33 miles from Saigon. North Vietnamese and Viet Cong battle units have long been in Cambodia, but it's the American and South Vietnamese presence there that has fanned the international storm of controversy. Why are they there? Why did they risk this campaign? To answer those questions, President Nixon went before his countrymen April 30th to explain his decision from the White House. Tonight, I shall describe the actions of the enemy, the actions I have ordered to deal with that situation, and the reasons for my decision. Cambodia, a small country of seven million people, has been a neutral nation since the Geneva Agreement of 1954, an agreement, incidentally, which was signed by the government of North Vietnam. American policy since then has been to scrupulously respect the neutrality of the Cambodian people. We have maintained a skeleton diplomatic mission of fewer than 15 in Cambodia's capital, and that only since last August. For the previous four years, from 1965 to 1969, we did not have any diplomatic mission whatever in Cambodia. And for the past five years, we have provided no military assistance whatever and no economic assistance to Cambodia. North Vietnam, however, has not respected that neutrality. Let's look again at the record. We've stopped the bombing of North Vietnam. We have cut air operations by over 20%. We've announced the withdrawal of over 250,000 of our men. We've offered to withdraw all of our men if they will withdraw theirs. We've offered to negotiate all issues with only one condition, and that is that the future of South Vietnam be determined not by North Vietnam and not by the United States, but by the people of South Vietnam themselves. The answer of the enemy has been intransigence at the conference table, belligerence at Hanoi, massive military aggression in Laos and Cambodia, and stepped up tax in South Vietnam designed to increase American casualties. This attitude has become intolerable. The president further explained that the North Vietnamese have been using sheltered sanctuaries in Cambodia to strike at South Vietnam. He described these sanctuaries as extending along the boundary of the two nations with the major concentrations here near Saigon and farther to the north in this region. He charged that although the United States and her allies had honored Cambodian neutrality, the North Vietnamese in recent weeks shed all pretense of doing the same and in fact were waging open warfare against the Cambodians. For the past five years, according to President Nixon, the North Vietnamese have used this network of shelters to move troops and materiel along the borders of South Vietnam to equip train and mass their forces for battle, and to provide a safe refuge when they returned from combat. But it was only last year that Cambodia assumed its current crucial strategic importance to North Vietnam. 
they shifted their war tactics to a strategy of prolonged struggle following defeats of their major offenses in 1968. This new strategy was revealed in detail in captured documents issued in August 1969 by the Central Office for South Vietnam, Hanoi's control center for the southern portion of the war. It calls for the North Vietnamese to shift the bulk of their combat forces from South Vietnam into the safety of Cambodian sanctuaries and there to await the withdrawal of United States troops from the war zone. Within hours after the president's announcement, reports of the success of the Cambodian operation began coming in. The advancing forces uncovered extensive North Vietnamese military installations, some so large and complex that field commanders described them as cities. As the search for the war arsenals continued to unfold along the Cambodian border, President Nixon held a press conference here in Washington on May 8th to answer the questions of the world's press. Two or three months. Uh, if that's the case, uh, what have we accomplished in Cambodia? Was it worth the risks? And what do we do when they reestablish those sanctuaries? At the present time, I will say that it is my belief, uh, based on what we have accomplished to date, that we have bought at least six months and probably eight months of time for the training of the Arvin, that is the Army of Vietnam, of South Vietnam. We have also saved, I think, hundreds if not thousands of Americans, as Frank Reynolds reported tonight on ABC, rockets by the thousands and small arms by the millions have already been captured and those rockets and small arms will not be killing Americans in these next few months. And what we've also accomplished is that by buying time, it means that if the enemy does come back into those sanctuaries next time, the South Vietnamese will be strong enough and well-trained enough to handle it alone. I should point out, too, that they are handling a majority of the assignment now in terms of manpower. From a tactical standpoint, President Nixon felt his decision had been vindicated by the middle of May. Evidence uncovered by the advancing forces revealed that the North Vietnamese had developed a massive military complex within Cambodia and that they had used those sanctuaries for attacks against both South Vietnam and Cambodia. The Americans and South Vietnamese already claimed success far exceeding expectations. President Nixon said the operation had already captured more ammunition than the communists used in the past entire six months in South Vietnam. And the Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird, felt it would take the North Vietnamese up to nine months to restock their lost supplies. In just two weeks, the combined Allied forces had located some 8,600 individual weapons with eight and a half million rounds of ammunition, 1,200 crew-served weapons such as machine guns, 29,000 rocket and mortar rounds, 1,500 landmines, 200 vehicles, 4,000 bunkers destroyed. By depriving the North Vietnamese munitions and supplies from their previously untouched fortresses, President Nixon has sought to relieve military pressure on Cambodia and South Vietnam. He has sought to permit continued withdrawal of forces from the war and he has sought to hasten peace through negotiations. This is Julian Barber from Washington, D.C.